button now. Hi, and today we've got our most important interview that we've ever done. Actually, it's the first interview. <laughs> 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 it's certainly very a very important one with Jonathan Porritt, who I think is probably the most, well, I think he's definitely the most influential green political thinker in the UK. And he's got quite a fair bit of competition there. And he's just produced a book entitled Hope, Hope in Hell, A Decade to Confront the Climate emergency published by Simon and Schuster and I'm going to be asking him some questions about that but first just a little bit on Jonathan's past if you haven't heard enough of, uh, enough of that well he was a founder and leading person in the Green Party and he followed that by becoming director of Friends of the Earth during a massive membership expansion uh, phase. And after that, he's continued in various leadership roles, including chair of the Sustainable Development Commission and, of course, Forum for the Future, which is a fantastic organization organizing lots of green initiatives and of course he's written a massive su succession of books perhaps the most famous of all and seminal was seeing green published in 1984 but he's published a lot of fantastic stuff since then of which this is the latest about the 10th or 11th I, uh, people are in doubt <laughs> never mind about that anyway <laughs> Um, so I'll um, jump into the uh, first question, unless you'd like to correct, uh, correct no, no, me. Great, or... uh, great to join you for a conversation. And uh, thanks for all your indefatigable efforts over all of those years. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we go back a long way, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. Yes. Um, first question, taking around a minute each, can you identify three key points you would like to highlight in your book, your new book? I think the first, and it is important, this one, is that it is not yet too late to do what we need to do about climate change. And that phrase too late is really important. It, it is already too late to stop massive disruption through climate change. There's no question about that being our physical reality now. But in my estimation, looking at the science, it is not too late to avoid what scientists call runaway climate change, which is when the feedback loops and the tipping points take us so deep into disrupted climate scenarios that it's too late to pull it back. So that's the central proposition, not too late to avoid runaway climate change if, 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 if we start to get our act together in the way that we need to. Okay, and your second point? The second is that you have to build this sequentially. And for me, the first building block is 100% renewable electricity. We can go there in an astonishingly short period of time if we want to. And I was reflecting on this the other day. Honestly, if we use the same kind of purposefulness and urgency that we've had to marshal to deal with COVID-19, there is no question that we could go to 100% renewable power generation systems all around the world using renewable solar, wind, particularly offshore wind, but also biomass and hydro and so on. And I see no reason, no impediment, technological, financial impediment to getting to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And that would, of course, provide the platform on which we could then do so much else. As we both know, that's not everything we need to do to decarbonize our economies, but it's a pretty good start. Right, great. Third, third point? For me, the third point then is arises out of that. We've got this massive scientific challenge now that if we don't move very, very fast, we're gonna be in dead trouble. We've got these solutions, and I think the solutions portfolio gets bigger, better, and more exciting every year, and nothing is really happening. And the bit in the middle is the politics. Because why aren't the politicians using the 
solutions portfolio to address this existential threat to the future of humankind. And that's where the politics comes in. I don't believe that politicians are going to do what they are now required to do without a great deal more pressure being brought to bear on them. And that includes, for me, the very powerful influence of young people, which became increasingly prominent in 2019, and the inevitability of civil disobedience to push politicians into places where they're disinclined to go. That, for me, is the inevitability of really addressing the climate emergency. Right, great. Um, is confronting the climate emergency necessary to save the planet, or is saving the planet necessary to confront the climate emergency? <laughs> I am actually really pleased to say that in the last three or four years, people have started to bring together their thinking about the planetary biodiversity ecosystem emergency on the one hand and the climate emergency on the other, because people can now see that, frankly, these two things march in lockstep, as it were. And climate is already having a huge impact, of course, on the, uh, on the natural world, massive impact, which continues to get worse. If you pose the question like that, which you've done, so I will answer it like that, we still have opportunities to heal the damage we've done to the natural world. And those healing capacities in nature are extraordinary. If we just get the policies settings right, we could see an incredible comeback from nature. With climate, it's different. If we don't stop the damage that we're doing through the um, accelerated pattern of climate change we have now, it could, as I just said, get to be too late. And then runaway climate change becomes irreversible. There's nothing we can do about it then. And we are then on an exceptionally dangerous route to something like a climate meltdown, the collapse of civilization, at which point biodiversity becomes a second order issue. Sorry to put it like that. So if you have to prioritize, you've got to sort out the climate emergency, because if you don't sort that out, I'm sorry to say that we will be whistling when it comes to sorting out the biodiversity and ecosystems emergency. Mm, that's quite a revolutionary message, but perhaps that leads on to the third question is, why do you place so much importance on what looked to me like reformist? I'm not criticizing them, but they look to me like reformist strategies like electric cars and clean meat rather than going all the way totally with bicycles and veganism? <laughs> yeah, I like the thrust of that question. Um, I see them in two ways. I see them as halfway houses. And I know that given the pattern of political uh, engagement so far, we're not going to do any big outright transformational steps. It just isn't in the political psyche to do that. So for me, going to electric vehicles is a really good way of getting rid of the internal combustion engine as fast as we possibly can. But as you know, I have got no illusions about electric vehicles be, being the end point of an integrated sustainable transport system. And what I basically say is we need this as, a, as an interim transitional stage while we move towards the obvious end point for transport, which is, I'm talking about cities primarily, which is citywide, integrated sustainable transport systems based on cycling, walking, integrated public transport, smart grids, big data to make all of this possible, and car sharing. So no individual ever has to own their own car again as an individual. It all goes to car fleets or car share schemes, which will be electric and autonomous. So that's the end point for me. And it's the same, I guess, with diet and with meat eating. I want to see, as you know, a massive reduction in the amount of meat that is consumed, because I think that is critically important, not just from a climate point of view, but from a health and biodiversity point of view. But I'm excited by the emergence of new technologies around what is called clean meat, using advanced industrial biotechnology to produce molecular equivalents, identical equivalents to meat that comes from animals, dead animals, as it were. And I just kind of know that people aren't going to leap in one fell swoop in their droves to veganism. And there are going to be a lot of people who are going to resist becoming vegetarians. So why not bring forward a set of solutions in that space, which gives us an extra way to reduce the massively damaging impact of animal-based protein reared 
in in nature as it were well actually it's never in nature it's almost always in intensive feedlots and uh, factories frankly but if we can get rid of that by having an alternative product then i think that's an exciting additional option right um if it's so important to put reducing greenhouse gas emissions at the top of the agenda why are you therefore so insistent on ruling out nuclear power i've battled with the with the, the kind of wretched views on nuclear power for my entire life so <laughs> when i joined the green party in 1974 i guess one of the first things that i came to realize was that nuclear power couldn't possibly give us what we really wanted and this was long before renewables became the competitor to nuclear that they now are. I mean, you look at levelized cost of energy comparisons, for instance, and nuclear is, is never going to be able to compete with renewables in that space. It can't really compete with anything at the moment. It's so massively expensive. But I've always had these big concerns. One about cost, that it is a, a very expensive way of providing us with the electricity that we need. Two, about waste, which is for me a moral and intergenerational issue. We have never found the ways of dealing with nuclear waste. It's still there as a huge problem, which means we're dumping onto future generations the costs of the benefits that we've had from nuclear power today, which is not acceptable for me. I'm passionate about this notion of intergenerational justice. And then thirdly, I'm because I come from that kind of background, still a very active member of CND and so on, the connection between nuclear civil nuclear power and nuclear weapons is tight still. And I don't believe, this may be seen by some people as a kind of crazy conspiracy theory, but I don't believe we would have all these madcap schemes for new nuclear power stations in the UK if we weren't a nuclear weapons state. Because the nuclear weapons establishment needs nuclear expertise. And in order to avoid them having to pay the cost for that, it's very convenient to have a nuclear industry that provides a flow of skilled people who then get involved in the weapons side of things, not in the nuclear power side of things. They are absolutely connected. So that, that story about nuclear weapons is a, is a critical one for me as well. And I haven't even put in my list there, as you've noticed, with great forbearance, the risks that we run now with nuclear power stations in terms of cybersecurity issues, which for me loom uh, very large. I try not to spend too much time thinking about that because honestly, that is a real nightmare in the making, in my opinion. Right. Moving on. Number, uh, next question. How important is dealing with population growth and what in practical terms can we do from this moment to deal with this problem? I think it's important and I've made a thing of that throughout my career as a sustainability activist. Um, I'm president of Population Matters. It's an organization that I think does a really good job bringing home to people the message about the need to address population as part of any integrated approach to global sustainability. And I say that for a very simple reason, that the more people there are on this planet, the harder it gets to bring forward the solutions that we now need, whether that is encroachment on the natural world, uh, disruption of ecosystems like uh, forests and so on, climate change, you just go on and on. It's just a very simple thing to say that the more people we have, particularly in high consumption middle class lifestyles, the harder it gets. At that point, you say, well, what can we do about it? And the great thing about this is that what we do to help us manage population growth more effectively are exactly the kind of things we'd want to be doing anyway, because we would want to be improving women's health care around the world. So access to reproductive health care becomes critical because we would want to be making it possible for girls to stay in school for as long as possible. One of the most important interventions you can make to help <laughs> limit average fertility later on in their lives. If we can provide access to contraception, 220 million women around the world then have as a basic right what we take for granted in a country like the UK. So for me, the the solutions to this are all about progressive, compassionate, non-coercive family planning and an investment essentially in women's rights all around the world. That's 
that's what makes me so passionate about population because it's actually about human rights. It's actually about improving the lot of half of humankind. So I never understand why environmentalists, some environmentalists are still so scared about talking of population, think that it's too controversial to bring into their scope of things that we have to deal with and therefore sit around on the sidelines saying it's not about population, it's about consumption. I hate these false polarities. It's, in my opinion, undeveloped thinking to go to a false polarity of that kind. It's both about overconsumption and it's about overpopulation and we have to address the two things together. Okay, thank you very much. Well, there's loads of other issues which you deal with in your book, Hope in Hell, A Decade to Confront the Climate Emergency, once again published by Simon and Schuster at a very modest price. And I must say, you write with such clarity. It's very easy to read, but on the other hand, you explain things in a very deep fashion. You've got this rare talent, if I might say. So anyway, <laughs> um, I'll, end, I'll end on, on that note. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, but... Uh, you covered a lot of ground in a, a very um, efficient amount of time. That's great, thank you. Okay, yes, same as energy efficiency, yes. Great, okay, cheerio, great. good luck. Thank you very much. Bye.